Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and once again, it's time for the Q&A, so let's go ahead and get this started. All right, first question. Hey Jason, my gem just added a glute ham raise device, so I just started doing glute ham raises, but after just a couple of reps, I started having insane cramps in my calves and had to stop the sets early and stretch walk it off, uh, even though I could easily do more reps. The cramps went away shortly after stretching walking, but as soon as I started another set, they came back. Any tips of what I should do about this? This is frustrating because I was really excited about the exercise my gym didn't have the GHR device before. Uh, how do I put this? Glute ham raises are hard and you're going to get cramps and things from them, particularly when you learn to use them and particularly when you start pushing it hard. Right now it's your calves. It's going to be your hamstrings later. So what you need to do is stop doing a calf raise on it which you probably don't realize that you're doing when you set yourself up into that device you need to set yourself in such a manner to where you can plant your heels hard against that back pad okay you press them hard against that back pad and because glute ham raises are really difficult we tend to want to push we tend to want to push through our toes right and it's very easy to do that without thinking about it. You, you'll do it unconsciously. So what you need to focus on is learning to keep your heels pushed hard against that plate. Okay, and not letting yourself slide up to where uh, your heels come off the plate. You need to keep those heels planted hard. So you put your feet in those rollers and then put, put your heels up back there. Uh, and if you go over to your toes, What's going to end up happening, because it's difficult, you're going to turn it into a calf raise. Now, here's what I'm going to say. You probably need to go to a next setting easier. Okay, Bring the pads that your knees go on out one more notch. You need to learn to get used to the device, learn to do it with good form. Right, Build up your strength doing it that way. And then you can work on progressing to harder uh, variations as far as, as the distance. But remember, the distance between the pads and rollers where your feet go versus what your knees sit up on, that distance will determine the biggest factor in the difficulty of the device. Okay? The further away it is, the bigger the gap, the easier it is. And as you bring those two closer and closer together, it gets a lot harder. Uh, like I would say, for example, in mine, I have 10 different settings. If I can do, say, 20 reps on one setting and I move it in a notch, I probably can only do 15 on the next one. So perspective, if I can do 15 and I bring it in a notch, I'm going to, I'm going to, it's going to be my 10 rep max for me to do 10 on the next setting up. So I lose on average about, about five reps, just an estimate. So go to the next easier setting and learn to plant those heels hard. And when you come forward, don't let the heels come off. You got to keep them planted hard. That's what's causing it. You're doing a calf raise onto your toes. Then when you deal with the hamstrings, that'll be a whole nother beast. Maybe we'll deal with that a different time. All right, next question. About to hit your strength standards on the big five and now 25% body fat. Should I recomp or cut? If I cut, how much of a deficit not to lose muscle gains? Thanks. Uh, you know what? Here's what I'm going to say, brother. You probably don't need to recomp really at this point. If, you, if you've reached those strength standards on the big five that I had set before, I don't even really use that anymore. But for those who, who remember what it is, it's 500 deadlift, 400 squat, 300 bench, 200 overhead press, and the ability to do a pull-up or a chin-up with 100 pounds of extra weight added. Right? That was the big five. And that latter accounts for body fat to some extent. So, so here's what I'm going to say. If you're 25% body fat and you're able to complete that last one and you have legs from squatting 400, you're doing pretty good. Right? You, you're, you're, you've got a good solid strength base built through all the basic movements. Right? You probably don't have any particularly weak or underdeveloped muscles anywhere in your body. Um, but you're 25% body fat. Let's, let's discuss health. You saw a guy saw me before. I've, I've been up past 20% and even had been confirmed with DEXA scans. Uh, I'm definitely under that these days, well under. So here's what I'm going to say. 
I realized at that point that that's unhealthy. And I'm going to say if you're 25% body fat, it's time to go ahead and trim down. I would save recomposition until you were under 20% body fat. Okay, we got to be honest with ourselves here, brother. Yes, we will be much, 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 much healthier and probably have, be metabolically healthy obese if you have that sort of strength base at that body fat, but it's not ideal for health. It really isn't. It's not. We, we've got to trim down under that. Okay, because you've got it. We've got to think about our long term health here. It matters. Not just being strong at any cost. Get down under 20%. When you get to tw- under 20%, when you get to 19% body fat, and you can confirm that with a DEXA or whatever you need to do, that's a good point to start recomping. Okay, because you can do some really good recomposition there. But at 25%, what I meant by the base, think about it this way. To recomposition, you have to be able to gain muscle relatively quickly still, you know, or at least some rate. The problem is that if you've already built a base like that, your muscle gains are going to be very, very, very slow. Like, let's say you recomp and gain five pounds of muscle over the next year on a recomp. You're only going to lose five pounds of body fat. If you're 25% body fat, you're still going to be a 20% plus. That's not healthy, right? That's an unhealthy level of body fat. You're, you're going to end up being, what, 22% or something after a year of recompositioning. And I've done stuff like that before, guys. And, and realistically, you don't feel as good. You're not going to, you don't feel as good when you do that. Okay. My advice, go ahead and trim down. Do a small deficit, lose lose a half a pound a week. Okay? Even if you lose two pounds a month, you can make some progress on your other lifts on two pounds of fat loss a month, of weight loss. All right? Lose two pounds. Till you get down to 19%, then you can recomp. That's that's what I would recommend. Get under 20% body fat, just for your health. All right, next question. Hey, Jason, do you ever program any squat variations for your clients for volume, like how you do the snatch grip deadlift as back off work, and which variations uh, do you choose if you do so? Um, Problem is with your latter answer, which variations I don't, because I don't do that. I don't do that at all. I, I generally do not have any of my clients do volume work on squatting. I don't. I don't see the point. We have speed squats and max squats. Why Why do we need anything else? Okay. We don't have the same options that we have with various deadlifts, right? We can do a bunch of deep deficits. We can do some snatch grip work. We can do stuff like that that's a lot harder and therefore a lot lighter weight and get maximum stimulus, All right? And when I have people do that is for short periods of time. Any of my lifters, because there's, there's a, a couple that are some people may not realize some of my lifters have decent sized followings and they don't, people don't even know they're my clients. Like they'll have 5,000 Instagram followers and stuff. Uh, so, <laughs> cause they are relatively jacked and strong. I don't, I don't have them do squatting. Okay. I don't have them do squatting for volume. People say, well, why not front squats? Why not? Zer-? Well, because none of my guys have a harness. So, I don't do that. If my guys need some sort of extra quad work, which is relatively rare, hip belt squats, isolateral movements, sled drags are great. Like if you have someone who's doing a bunch of sled dragging, why, why are you even worried about their quads at all? Especially if they're throwing plyos in. I mean, look at how my quads do these days. Do you see me doing any extra quad work? No, we don't need it. And then we deal with the, the recovery side. But when, even when I deal with those extra pulls like that, we pick pulls that you cannot pull anywhere near as much weight, okay, number one. Number two, I don't have them do it for long periods of time. At most, three weeks, okay, at most three weeks. And then we take it back out and we replace it with other more hypertrophy-oriented work, all right? And that's only really for some of my guys who just need that extra pop off the floor. They're really struggling breaking a deadlift off the floor. We're not getting there quick enough off the speed work. We'll do stuff like that. Or we'll even rotate in like deficit work like you see me doing there in the background for their speed pulls. Okay. 
That's what we do. But I don't have them do supplemental squat work because well, it's the only benefit a squat has over a good morning. We do good mornings in place of that, really. Good morning variations. It's the only advantage it has, more quad work. There's other movements we can do. We can build quads without axial loading as supplemental lifts. Right? It's just it's not that hard to program those. So I would rather use a good morning. If I'm going to use a non-deadlift hip hinge or any lower body exercise that's going to have axial loading for supplemental work, I'm going to have them do good morning work. And we'll do variations. And yes, some of my guys do do really heavy good mornings. We max on good mornings. So, no, I don't, I don't have them do that at all. All right, guys, so that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative, and I will talk to you guys next time in part two.